Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee Break School Psychology. Um, with me, as always, is my coffee, um, and I have a wonderful guest today, Dr. Patricia Zurita Onya. Um, tell me, do you have your coffee with you today? Um, yes, um, I have my coffee, but I left it upstairs. <laughs> okay, well, I'll allow it. I'm going to make an exception. You can be on my coffee chat without your coffee, but just this one time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the exception, Rebecca. <laughs> yes, we all are, you know, forgiving and we're open and we're self-compassionate about these things. And that actually segues right into what we're going to talk about today, which I'm just thrilled because this is such an issue. As a school psychologist, as a mom, I'm seeing so much anxiety in our students, in our children. Um, I recently read that um, Google searches for does my child have anxiety are up 900% this wow. year. So we definitely have a, a crisis around anxiety. And a subset of that that I find so interesting is this concept of perfectionism. We don't always wrap perfectionism in anxiety, um, but I think that it's really important to talk about. And so we're going to talk about three ways that you can help your child um, or a child that you work with, with perfectionism anxiety. Um, so first, let's just introduce my fabulous guest. Um, can you please tell us a little bit about the work you do and um, kind of how you help families and students and adults with perfectionism? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, well, as as you say, I have a very long Latino name, Patricia Esperanza Zurita Oña. Um, it's very, very long. Um, so my clients call me Dr. Z. And I specialize on acceptance and commitment therapy for anyone dealing with fear-based struggles like phobia, panic attacks, obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety, uh, indecisions, procrastination, perfectionists. Um, basically every single day I am working with kids, teenagers and adults dealing with some form of fear-based reactions. And I am super, super passionate about sharing skills that blend mindfulness and behavioral interventions. Uh, because I think with mindfulness, we can learn to step back and watch our mind and watch our feelings without being consumed by them. And then once we have this perspective, we can make a shift towards behaving differently. So I think that's what I do every single day. That's great. So is acceptance and commitment therapy, and we'll get to perfectionism in a moment. Is that like if mindfulness and CBT had a baby? That's a, that, oh my, that's a beautiful way of putting it. Yes, yes. Acceptance and commitment therapy is one type of cognitive behavior therapy. But what is very unique to acceptance and commitment therapy is that we encourage you to identify your values, what truly matters to you, what really speaks to your heart. And then from that place, take action. And when we think about perfectionists, for example, um, it almost every single week, someone calls my practice because people are stressed because they are not getting the results they want to get in a paper or the kids are stressed with their college applications or a person is stuck trying to make the best decision or a person is very stressed because they are concerned that putting a dinner for their relatives on the weekend is not going to go well and why do people judge them? So one of the ways in which we apply acceptance and commitment therapy for perfectionists is by really unpacking a little bit what is driving these perfectionistic behaviors, um, why people are so overly concerned and hook onto this idea of getting things right and perfect. Um, so primarily I'm using ACT skills, acceptance and commitment skills, to tackle those behaviors, to really see what's behind them. That's great because I know that as a school psychologist, you know, I, I was trained in CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, like change your thoughts, change your behaviors. And right. there were some kids that, you know, that just fell on deaf ears. They weren't sort of emotionally ready to even talk about, uh, you know, and it felt really, um, really hard to like to get in right so it's like they don't really want you to challenge their behaviors <laughs> and their thoughts and how they're thinking about things they i needed to peel back and that's where i think mindfulness came in really great which is just owning and accepting this is where you are and this is how you're feeling 
And mm-hmm. then that opens a door for some CBT strategies. That's uh, fantastic. I, I didn't know acceptance and commitment therapy was a thing until I met um, Dr. Z. So um, have a look at some of her other books. I know you have quite a few on um, ACT. Um, but let's talk about perfectionism. So uh, one of the things you know that always surprises me as a school psychologist is you know, I have these kids who are really anxious and really perfectionistic and really stuck. And I always wonder, like, what's behind the music? Like, why are kids perfectionist, perfectionistic, <laughs> right? What kind of drives that? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great question. And it's a question that I get to hear a lot. The way that I think of perfection is perfectionistic actions are the outcome of being driven by some fear. Usually it's an extreme fear of being a failure, an extreme fear of making a mistakes. And there is also attachment to how things supposed to be. Like I need to get an A. Uh, I need to write the best essay possibly I can. Um, and the other aspect behind perfection is, is that people think that their self-worth is defined by their accomplishments. So those are the four things that are behind perfectionists. Intense fears of being a failure, intense fear of making mistakes, attachment to rules, how things are supposed to be, how I should be this perfect friend, and then my, my identity is defined by my accomplishments. Um, and the other way in which I think of perfection is, um, in response to what you were saying, I think it is true if we tell a person dealing with perfectionistic actions that they should let go of their standards, that they should stop caring, it's very alienated. It comes here and goes there, right? And we see that with the kids and with the teenagers. It doesn't make sense. Um, there's one time I'm working with a high school student working on her essays um, for college. And then I somehow, I don't know what we're talking about exactly, but I made a comment. I'm wondering how will it be to go to bed around 10 p.m. the latest and then wake up the next day earlier so you can pick it up, you know, your essay. Because my, my client was staying very late until 2 a.m., 3 a.m. and waking up the next day super tired. And this kid look at me, Rebecca, and say, Dr. Z, are you out of your mind? Why should I stop working so hard? <laughs> um, so to me, that was very important because if we tell people to let go of their standards, as you say, comes here, it goes there. But the way that I think of perfection is, is acknowledging that some people are deeply prone to care. They deeply care about what they are doing. They deeply care about parenting. They deeply care about the, you know, the, the faith. They deeply care about how they're practicing sports. And because they deeply care, of course, they want to get things right and perfect. I love that because it's sort of a reframe for something we think of perfectionism is always a bad thing, but maybe we can lean into some of the strengths of perfectionism, which is you really care about your math homework. You really care about doing well. You really care about your future. Um, And then you're leaning in with like, what is their value? And then they don't, they're not fighting you on that because you're agreeing with them that this is a strength you have. You really care. That's right. That's right. I think most of the literature, unfortunately, and in social media as well, we have demonized perfectionistic actions. We have tell people, let go. But what happens in the research, actually, people don't make long lasting changes. And and also, if you think about the clients we work with, none of my clients call me and say, I'm dealing with perfectionistic tendencies. They don't come with that. They say, I am very stressed because I'm not getting the best results. So I think inviting people to find the golden nuggets of their perfectionistic actions is much more compassionate. It's much more accepting of who they are and what they are prone to. And we just have to teach them skills to distinguish when good enough is good enough and you let go of the rest and when you have to pursue excellence. So oh, teach people so cool. that dance a little bit, right? It's, it's, I think, much more flexible and helps people to engage more in learning skills versus quickly telling them, let go of your standards, you're working too hard. No one will respond to that. I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's room for messaging, like let's relax our standards to a level only you notice, um, or let's figure out when enough is enough. And that 80%, is, that extra 20% of effort isn't gonna really pay off. 
And it's educating people about why people are perfectionists and they care about things and they don't have that gauge for when enough is enough. Um, and then also, you know, I think what you mentioned about, you know, demonizing perfectionism is so critical, which leads us to our second point. Our first one was trying to figure out why people are perfectionistic and you outlined those four reasons. Um, and I can think of four kids that meet that avatar of those reasons, um, you know, right away. And even ad adults in, in our lives and identify myself as well as having some of those perfectionistic tendencies. Um, but is perfectionism always evil? Um, thank you for asking that. I don't see it that way. You know, I actually think that is a very simplistic message. You know, all the things are good and bad. It really reduces the complexity of what a person is driven for and how they see themselves and how they genuinely want to give their best. It just happens that they don't know to discriminate, to differentiate. Uh, they don't know how to make effective and workable decisions. Uh, they don't know how to handle this fear of making mistakes, this intense fear of being a failure. And if you think about it, um, I cannot tell you how many times, um, even though I have a successful career, my mind told me, Patricia, you're not good enough. What if no one reads your book? What if blah, blah, blah? So it is human to experience fear. It is human to know that our mind will come with all these stories. So Telling people that's wrong, get rid of that voice, is not, it's really against, I think, you know, our natural tendencies as humans, because our mind would always come up with messages like that. But telling people, let's learn to make room for those thoughts. Let's learn to make room for those feelings of being a failure and do what matters to you as it matters to you. Is actually much more um, respectful of a person's proneness to duplicate about what they do. So I don't think that perfectionism is always bad. The literature has distinguished between an ad adaptive and maladaptive perfectionist, um, helpful and unhelpful perfectionist. But I think if you look at the clients we work with, and if I think of my life, I don't think, I think we're referring to the ends of a continuum, but there's a lot of in between. There is a lot in between. So I think that, again, the framework I use is acknowledging that a person is deeply prone to care a lot. They care a lot. And because of that, they want to get things right and perfect. I love that strength-based approach because criticizing yourself for being perfectionism is sort of a vicious cycle, right? right. It's like, oh, I shouldn't be perfectionism, perfectionistic. And, and then you feel bad about being perfectionistic, but you care deeply. So it just sort of perpetuates that negative cycle. Another thing that you flagged that I think is so fascinating is we don't always, um, you know, think about perfectionism. You know, we think it was, you know, it's bad, it's good. And, and there is that continuum. And what I want to kind of share a, a personal story is you know, I, when I first started out as a school psychologist, I wanted to do everything correct. And I, I don't know about what it was like for you as an early practitioner, but speaking to school psychs out there, you didn't want to look like you had this sort of um, fear of not looking like you knew what you're doing and you didn't mm -hmm. want to ask for help because like, yeah. you know, that would show that you weren't worthy or um, maybe this imposter syndrome, like, oh my God, I'm faking it. Everyone's going to catch me at some point, the shoe's going to drop. Um, and at that time I was seeing a therapist myself to cope with all of the stress. And, and I had sort of put perfectionism as like, this is a bad thing. I need to undo that. I need to, you know, make that stop. Um, and it was really struggling for me. And she said, well, there's other, there's perfectionism isn't always bad. She's mm -hmm. like, think about creative perfectionism. When you're creating a piece of artwork or you're creating something that you love to create and you really work on it to make it just right, and that fills your soul and your, it fills your cup, that's a fine type of perfectionism. And so my perfectionism now comes out in like Instagram posts and things behind my wall that look pretty. Like you mm -hmm. can channel some of that perfectionism into something that brings you joy. But I think it's like the, the wisdom to know the difference, right? Yeah. It's okay to channel your perfectionism in this way, in these moments, in these situations but not so much in this one. And I think that's where kids and teens don't have that wisdom yet. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. And it's a beautiful example to show um, how active skills can be handy in that distinction. Um, so one of the ways in which I help people to make that distinction is 
but really when they had this urge to do more and more, to work harder and harder, to push and push, I invite them to step back a little bit. Let's take a deep breath and let's really, really look at what's driving this. Is this driven by this awful fear of making a mistake? Or is it driven because you care about that value? Because there is something that really speaks to your heart. Um, another question is asking people, are you, are you pursuing and chasing an outcome? Uh, do you want, you know, are you chasing getting the A or the best uh, written essay possibly? Or are you staying with the process of, because we don't have control of outcomes. So I think there are key questions that we can teach people and everyone can do this to make that distinction. When it's driven by this intensity of being a failure, when it's driven by your values. And when you make that distinction, then you know how to capture the golden nuggets that comes with these perfectionistic actions. So they don't have to work against you, but they can actually start working in your favor. I love that. So let's do our, our third pro tip. And mm -hmm. if you're willing to do this with me um, extemporaneously, uh, we're going to harness our inner improv skills um, and do a little role play Lovely. in which I am, let's say, um, I don't know, what age should I be? Where, where do we see this bubble 14, up? 14, 13. 14. I'm a 14 year old freshman um, in high school and I have an essay to write. Mm -hmm. and I am completely stressed out about it. Okay. And scene. Okay. <laughs> oh, let's go. So I, have this, I have this essay, Dr. Z, and like, I can't even get started. It's just a blank cursor on the page, and it's just blinking at me, and every time I write something, I hate it, and I delete it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That sounds really, really stressful. Will it be okay if I ask you a couple of questions so we can figure out what's going on so I can be helpful to you? Yes, yes, that would be great. Because I got to get this done. Because if I don't get it done, then I'm not going to get an A. And if I don't get an A, I'm not going to get into college. If I don't get into college, I'm not going to get into the top five law schools. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Where did you go? Are you here, here? Or are you there, there? Where did your mind took you right now? <laughs> I went, I went there, there. Okay, fine. Let's, let's talk about now. It's okay. I, I can see that. So one of the things I'm going to be noticing is checking on your mind, when your mind takes you into this disaster and awful future, if you don't make it in college, or if you stay here in the present. Okay. Because we don't have control of what's going to happen the next minute, but we can make the best of this moment. How does it sound? Can we try that? Okay. Okay. We can do that. So you start by saying that, oh man, you have been working so hard with this essay, you have to write it, and then we're, we're getting a little bit anxious. Can I, can I ask you a little bit more about that? What does your mind tell you about writing that essay? What happens if you don't write the perfect essay that you want to write? How will that be? Then I'm going to get a bad grade. Okay, okay. And if you get a bad grade, what's the hardest part about it? What's so hard about getting a bad grade? I know it's a very dumb question because you care about school, but what's so hard about getting a bad grade for you? When I get a bad grade, like I'm disappointed in myself and then my parents are disappointed and I think my teacher is disappointed in me. Mm -hmm. So bear with me, bear with me. If that, if that were the case, that people get disappointed on you, that your teachers get disappointed on you, what does your mind tell you about who you are? What's so hard about it? that I'm like a bad student and I don't care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, bear with me. Is it possible, it is possible that we are very concerned about being a bad student, that you don't care about anything. And because of that, you keep trying to get the best essay and do more and more. Is it possible that you're doing all these things, staying late, searching for hours on Google, reading all types of books for writing the best essay? because you're trying to protect yourself from being a bad student. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I do. I don't want to be a bad student. So I just work harder and harder and longer and stronger and faster. Yeah, no, I get it. You know, I, I get it also, you know, I don't want to be a bad clinician. I don't want to be a bad coach. So I think it's very understandable. But how is it working for you that when your mind, you know, has this thought, like, you know, what if I'm a bad student, then you do all these things. How does it work to stay until 5 a.m., 4 a.m., writing and writing, um, researching, talking to people? How does it really work in your life with your friends, with your health? How does your body respond to it? Well, 
I hate it because I don't get enough sleep and then I'm cranky and then I can't see my friends because I'm working on my essay. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, would you be willing to try something different? Yeah, yeah, I'll try anything. I got to get this thing done and I I, I got to get a, have my life back. Yeah, yeah. I want you to get these things done. I want you to get your essay done. But how would it look if in the next couple of sessions I teach you skills for you to get this thing done without losing yourself? Without, you know, spending hours and hours looking at the roof and getting worried, you still get your thing done, but without, without, yeah, without losing yourself. And I will teach you all the skills to do that. Would you be willing to do that? Sign me up yesterday and seen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's good. You know what I loved about that? And folks watching out there, listen to the language that Dr. Z was using. Would you be willing? Indulge me. I wonder, it's sort of the like try-in before buy-in vibe, right? Instead of, I have the solution because I'm Dr. Z, it's, would you be willing to try that? I loved that reframe. Thank you. Thank you. And Rebecca, you did a beautiful job showing that this is exactly how it shows shows up, I think, in the the work I do. And you have seen this with your students that they quickly go into the future. What's going to go wrong? How I'm going to fail? And a lot of the work is reminding people that we are here, here. We're not there. We're not there in the future. We're not in the past. Um, And also to really honor honor the possibility that they can get things done as it matters to them, but without losing themselves. I think mm-hmm. that is something that, you know, telling people, oh, don't worry, just, just write an essay, you know, make some mistakes, is not going to go anywhere. But really helping them, yeah, it's possible you get there without losing yourself, without exercising, without having fun with your friends. That's a very different conversation. Yeah, and I think that, one of our greatest gifts as school psychologists out there um, and as teachers and educators and clinicians that we can give kids is a sense of hope, right? It feels really hopeless when you're in that moment and it's 10 o'clock at night and you can't figure it out yourself. Instead of saying, I have the answer, let me give it to you. It's like, do you want to hear how other students actually are able to get stuff done and not stress out and see their, it's like, oh my God, there's hope. That's and right. when I, we were talking to me, I really felt that sense of like, oh, okay, there's, there's hope. I don't have to stay in this. And that's where I, I felt the, both the mindfulness and the CBT kind of having a baby <laughs> <laughs> right then and there. This is fantastic. I would love for folks to be able to find more of your work. Um, I would love to shout out this new book that's just come out. Um, Acceptance and Commitment Skills for Perfectionism and High Achieving Behaviors. Y'all, it is chock full of practical strategies, great storytelling. Um, Where can they find you? Where can they get this book um, for if you are working with kids with perfectionism, if if you yourself are struggling with perfectionism, um, or if you're a parent of a kid who you're having those meltdowns and shutdowns. And and I, I find it to be those sort of logical get you nowhere moments. Yeah. Right. Where you're like, it's OK, just do it tomorrow. And it's just like hard. No, they're stuck in that, you know, kind of stress moment. So where can people find you in this book for some practical, wonderful strategies? Um, thank you so much, Rebecca. The, the book is available on Amazon. People can get it there. I also have an audio book that I created as a companion to this printed version of the book. I will send you the link. Uh, my website is thisisdrz.com. Um, and I usually hang it on Twitter. I'm not so cool to be on Instagram or Facebook. I'm a little bit, you know, old school. So I'm hanging on Twitter. Uh, I think my handle is Dr. Z Behaviorist. Um, and Rebecca, if it's okay, you just say something really, really important here. There is a lot of parents about raising their kids and they also get trapped in being the perfect parent and they put so much pressure on themselves. It's not just about their kids, but it's also how much they are holding into this idea that, you know, their kid has to always behave well, has to look well, has to do this and that. And if the kid misbehaves or has like a C, somehow that reflects what type of parents they are. So there is a lot of people out there trapped into this perfect parenting. And in the book, there are 30 micro skills to actually, you know, step back and watch a little bit how these perfectionistic actions are working for you. And that's for any person, including parents. Oh, that's fantastic. And I love that term micro skills. Um, and, and the mindfulness, you know, I always think of like parenting as 
you know, I was actually a perfect parent before I was a parent in case you're wondering, <laughs> I had it all figured out. And then, you know, I have my own kids and I'm triggered and they're triggered and we're triggering each other and my stuff comes up and their stuff comes up and we're all like unpacking it together. <laughs> but once I heard a, a metaphor about like the difference between being in a waterfall and watching the waterfall. Mm -hmm. So as a parent, you know, sometimes I was in the waterfall and I was being drenched and I was in that moment, that hot parenting moment where I was stressed and my kids were stressed and we were triggering each other. And if you, you keep saying step back, and this is the visual that comes to mind, stepping back out of the waterfall, I'm like, oh, look, I am in a hot parenting moment where we are triggering each other. Just that tiny sort of mental step back is enough to take a mindful pause, reboot and respond in a different way. And that's really kind of the, the fabulous work um, you're doing around mindfulness, which is, it's not just for kids. It's not just for Buddhist monks. You don't have to come off of a Himalayan mountaintop to enjoy the benefits of mindfulness. It can be just a step back, deep breath and evaluate the situation with non-judgment. This is not, you know, reflecting on my, I'm not a bad parent because my kid's melting down. That's right. That's right. That's beautifully, beautifully said. I think I'm a big proponent of using mindfulness skills on the go. Uh, if we can go to a meditation retreat, that's lovely. But reality is in our days, in the inform information era, we go back to back to things. That's just the world that we're living. So I think it's important to really to think about mindfulness and behaviors. They don't have to be only for the coaching or therapy session. They can be put into action every single day with these micro moments of choice, right? So hopefully that helps your audience. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. Everyone go get the book. I'm going to drop all those links um, in the show notes below. So you can go to this is drz.com um, and Dr. Z underscore behaviorist on Twitter. Um, I am newer to Twitter, but I, I am enjoying um, the, the community on there. So um, if you're a Twitter person, then um, hop on over and follow um, Dr. Z. And it's been a pleasure to have you on Coffee Break School Psychology. Um, hopefully you'll come back with coffee, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, thank you so much for having me. And yes, next time I will make sure I have my cafecito, of course. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone.